Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our two speakers for today. First, Dr. Malia Johnson. Dr. Johnson received her Doctorate of Education in Administration and Higher Education from Point Park University in 2018. And she is currently the Director of Equity and Inclusion for Carlo University. Dr. Johnson is a strong advocate for equity and diversity in the educational arena and has been for 20 plus years. She has experience ranging from early childhood advocacy to teaching instruction of doctoral level courses surrounding conflict management. Collaborating and working with students of all genders, races, ethnicities, and backgrounds has been her area of focus while at Carlo. Mr. Ryan Scott is our next speaker. Mr. Scott is the director of the Social Justice Institutes at Carlo University. As director, Mr. Scott provides vision, leadership, and strategic direction to four distinctive institutes. The well-established Grace Ann Geibel Institute for Justice and Mercy, the Center for Community Engaged Learning, the Center for Youth Media Advocacy, and the Educate for Justice Initiative. Mr. Scott is currently pursuing his Doctorate of Education with an area of concentration in higher education management. His dissertation will be focused on culturally responsive pre-college programs and the connection to college matriculation for students of color. I want to thank you both for being with us today and please take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Malia Johnson. I'd like to welcome you. I want to honor your time. Um, I thank you for being part of this discussion. Uh, I've had the opportunity to have several discussions similar to this this summer um, with the Carlo community and within other communities. And I want to always say that I think it is critical that we have continue these conversations. This is a continuation of some that were started already this summer and that we uh, never get tired of having this conversation just based on the state that our country is currently in. Um, Ryan and I chose this topic, which is not a new topic. I mean, it's been heard several times throughout the summer um, and actually through the last several months, racism, a pandemic within the pandemic, because as, as we're all really still in COVID and that there are, you know, this is the height of COVID really for many of us, it's a global pandemic, we know. We're also dealing with another crisis, which is one of racial inequality and social injustice. Brian, you can turn to the next slide. And to be very clear, we know that this is not a new uh, crisis, but rather the result of years of systemic and institutionalized racism that has led to discrimination and disadvantage of particularly people of color, black and brown individuals. Uh, I said this earlier this year, we didn't get here overnight and this is not something that's going to be solved overnight either. But also for those individuals in the black and brown community, we're not only just experiencing COVID, which is such a infectious disease and a huge threat to the largest threat of the century to Americans period. But for black and brown people, we're still facing police violence. We're still facing high unemployment rates as well. So it is um, truly a pandemic within the pandemic for our communities. You can turn. Many, um, many African American, and I believe I was reading in the New York Times, one gentleman says, you know, he said, it's such a moment of pain within our community right now. And what I have to figure out is, am I going to die from COVID-19 or am I going to die from the system, which is police? And just some data that I uh, have, and I actually executed it, pulled this out of some data that when I had a collaboration with uh, CMU this past summer, where we did building the black and brown communities, building solidarity, students really had the opportunity to highlight their skills and come before other students in the CMU and Carlo community and share this information. And so some of this information has been pulled out from that presentation, but one of the points I really wanted to focus in on was that Black people account for 13% of the U.S. population. 
However, 23% of that is COVID related deaths. And that to me is just it's such an alarming number that if we're 13% of the population, while well, we're already at 23% of COVID related deaths. And if you look at the chart, as you can see, you know, that is a lot, those are the largest racial ethnic groups and the 20 largest death rates. I mean, that's to me, it's alarming. Um, and then you, again, you'll see in my presentation, I talk about do your research, go and do further research so you can find out even more information on su such subjects as this, even down to Allegheny County. Ryan, you can go to the next slide. And then we talk about, uh, you know, so we looked at COVID and we're dealing with those COVID related deaths and how it's impacting the black and brown communities and not just how it's impacting them. Uh, one thing I didn't mention there was, you know, a lot of black and brown communities cannot even get testing, have not had the opportunity to do that. So that's a whole, uh, another aspect that we want to bring into the discussion at some point, but not now. Moving on to the mapping of police murders nationally. You can see what it says. I'm not going to read all the data for you, but it says black, black people are three times more likely to be killed by police than white people. Black people are 1.3 more likely to be unarmed compared to white people. And then I dropped down and I wanted to look at, and you can read on your own, 99% of killings by police from 2013 to 2019 have not not, and I want to say not, resulted in officers being charged with the crime. And I know Ryan and I were talking earlier today, and Ryan, you can chime in here with me, but this is where we were talking about um, some of the victims who, again, I mean, and there's a list of them, but which was the one that you were sharing about earlier, Ryan? So I was talking about the, uh, the murder of Breonna Taylor and the fact that uh, the officers uh, who who murdered her uh, are still not not charged or convicted for for her murder, um, and time and time again, this is one of the uh, pandemics, if you will, uh, for for the sake of our presentation, um, that is is evident and it's happening uh, on a continual basis. And we like to just bring light and shed light on these these instances so that we can start being advocates uh, in these regards. Thank you. And so there, I mean, there are lists of victims who their assault, their, their murders have not been at all dealt with. But Ryan and I were just sharing this earlier today. And I know nationally what we're seeing, you can move on Ryan. Um, nationally what we're seeing is a lot of people, and the reason why I chose that, actually, can you go back to that last slide? Why I chose that slide of having George Floyd there is what happens naturally over time is we tend to um, get caught up in our daily lives COVID is such a huge pandemic right now, and as we need to pay a lot of attention to it, but also the pandemic of this racism and this police brutality, I don't want this image to be something that we forget about, because for many of us, this is day in and day out, and what we'll do is forget because we have so many other things to do. I wanted this image to just remain in our minds and remain very present at all times of what is constantly going on in the United States and within our communities against black and brown people. Okay, um, what I don't like to do though is always just leave us on that note of the negative. I like to deal with ways that we can build and be solution oriented. So what I've done here is gather, done some research. There are different ways and we presented this in our solidarity event. Evaluate your biases, educate yourself. There is no greater time than now to lose the excuse of I did not know. You need to know and you need to educate yourself. We got the wonderful web out here. You can Google anything. Siri can tell you everything. It is time to dig in and do the research and no longer use the excuse of I didn't know. It's also time to lose the excuse of I'm really uncomfortable having that conversation. Great. I want you to feel that uncomfort because when you're at that place of discomfort is when change can occur. Find someone who will hold you accountable, help them just like we do for when we're wanting to lose weight or we set goals, find you an accountability buddy who's gonna say, hey, not sure about that, you know, check, someone who will help you check yourself. We do it for all, th all types of things, let's do it for this. Engage in activism work and advocate for equity. Ryan is going to be able to speak to that a little bit more in his uh, 
presentation and I will let him do so. Um, refuse to allow your privilege to benefit your causes only. And that's a hard one sometimes that we choose to ignore, but it's time to deal with who has privilege, who does not have privilege. What is my privilege? When is it at work in me? And don't allow it just to benefit you any longer. Surround yourself with individuals who are making, who are diverse in their thinking and ways and being. For some reason, when we get to diversity, we think it is just diversity of culture or race. But diversity is also diversity of thought. So surround your people, surround yourself with people who definitely think differently than you. And one of my favorites here is to speak up, refuse to sit by and allow discriminatory practices and conversations to be held around you. At all times, speak up and refuse to allow this behavior to continue. And what I love so much, and right now it says, when you know better, when you know better, you do better by Maya Angelou. As of right now, we're all held accountable. This is information that we're being given. So right now, you know better. Moving forward, I wanted to recap just briefly some of the things that happened this summer out of the Office of Equity Inclusion. And some of these were in combination with other departments on campus. Student outreach went forth this summer to individuals and in group sessions just to make sure that our students felt like someone cared, someone was concerned, someone was checking in on them to find out how they were doing during COVID, how the death of George Floyd impacted them and their family. And those group sessions were really um, powerful and I'm thankful that I had a chance to touch those students' lives. Town Hall prayer service was in co combination with uh, campus ministry where we did a overview of racism and there were four types of racism, but we really focused in specifically on in individual racism and how it impacts us and what we can do to change it within the Carlo community. And we walked away saying we knew that that was not gonna be the last of our conversations, but the beginning and that we were committed on the Carlo campus as we even made a commitment verbally and read out loud what we need to do as a community. And then there was the Building Solidarity in the Black and Brown Communities, the CMU, um, which was powerful because students from both campuses really spoke up and talked about what they felt they needed from our institution as Carlo and CMU to feel supported and felt like they were going to be getting solidarity built for them during the school year. And then this coming Saturday is a Carlo Diversity Panel Forum discussion. I believe it's at 11 o'clock. It's for incoming freshmen, but for anyone who is interested in learning more about diversity from the student's perspective, I'll be moderating it, but it will be students sharing their experiences with other students. And then last but not least, sometime in September, we'll have a listening forum for students where we get to sit down and really listen to them as administrators and student affairs individuals so we can find out really what they're thinking, what they need, and then we can dialogue back with them and share some of the things we're doing to hopefully address their needs. And so with all that being said, Ryan will take over and he will really share from his perspective and from his office what they are doing to deal with this pandemic within the pandemic. And thank you for your time. Oh, I left something great off. Resources, how could I leave that off? What I will do is probably post them in the chat as well some great resources to support the Black community proactively coping with racism, Black women for wellness. There's some podcasts on there. I know that you probably won't be able to get them all right now, so I will try and put them all in the chat for you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Um, and I would encourage you all uh, to check out those resources as uh, many of them are, are really great resources uh, to start discussion uh, surrounding race. Um, the Social Justice Institute's in collaboration with the Office of Equity and Inclusion, and I see we have Dr. Pearl also on, on the uh, presentation as well, um, who is uh, the new director for, Ac for the Atkins Center for Ethics, uh, has partnered for many of these activities, uh, and also I see Dr. Chris Gabridge also on here as well, who has uh, been instrumental in a lot of these uh, activities. Um, but we've had several different speakers come in regarding race and presentations and workshops and, and the like. Um, you see uh, Dr. Fania Davis who did uh, restorative justice practices. Uh, we did a, two COVID panels on race in policy and grassroots uh, nonprofit organizations. Uh, we brought in Dr. Yusuf Salam from the Exonerated Five last year. Uh, we did a presentation, Long Live Their Legacy with the Pittsburgh Pir Pirates. 
uh, and several others throughout uh, our time here. So Carlo has a rich history being committed to social justice, started with the Sisters of Mercy, and we like to continue that tradition in, in our daily lives. Some of the upcoming events for the fall, we have the Pittsburgh Solidarity for Change mural project right now. And actually us in the Office of Equity and Inclusion will be partnering on this initiative. We're encouraging uh, Carlo faculty, staff and students and alumni uh, to participate in that project. There'll be murals around the city of Pittsburgh and various um, marginal, historically marginalized areas. And we'd like to get you guys involved. Um, and there's several ways to do that. If you want it to, if you're interested, please let me know. You do not have to be an artist to be a part of that project, but it's a good way to, uh, for community socially distanced, of course, um, to participate in this sort of project. We'll also be partnering with uh, the library on the Anti-Racism Book Club. We're gonna be looking at Ibram Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Uh, so we're encouraging faculty and staff to participate in that, more details to follow. We'll be doing anti-racism workshops in September. We'll also be doing a racial justice and health justice workshop, uh, working with the uh, School of Nursing. Uh, we're gonna have our ongoing presidential lecture series and it's our second annual. Uh, so this year we're gonna be focused on understanding um, justice through the lens of social justice and ethics um, with COVID-19 and in regards to race. And then we're also gonna be working at the Carlo Votes campaign, uh, which is gonna be looking at policies and educating for justice. We're gonna be educating on platforms. We're gonna have debate watch parties, nonpartisan of course, but we wanna make sure whatever issues that you're passionate about, you learn about, and you make educated decisions based on that. Okay, so we started talking about racism and what does it mean to be an anti-racist versus being, you know, being a racist? Um, so we have six different ways. These are actually recommended from Ibram Kendi's book. So this isn't something that I created, but it was something that stood out to me and I thought that I should share with you today. The first one is understanding the definition of racist. So if we look at the definition of racism or, or racist, uh, we look at Webster's dictionary as a belief that race is a primary, primary determinant of human traits and capacities and that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race. Number two, stop saying I'm not racist. It's not enough just to say I'm not racist and it's often a self-serving sentiment. Uh, Dr. Kendi says that people cons can constantly change the definition of what racism is and what it, what it does, so it doesn't apply to them. For example, if you're a white nationalist who is nonviolent, then you might see the Ku Klux Klan as racist. If you're a Democrat that thinks there's something culturally wrong with black people, then, then racist, you, if you're a Democrat that thinks that something's culturally wrong with black people, then racist, you might say people are Republicans. Number three. Identify racial inequities and disparities. Racism yields racial inequities and disparities in every sector of private and public life. And that's everything from criminal justice to education, to politics, employment, income, home ownership even um, is another aspect. Being anti-racist means learning about and identifying inequities and disparities that give in particular white people or any racial group material advantages over people of color. Number four, confront the racist ideas you've held onto or continue to hold. We must recognize our implicit biases. Um, I know we, I saw a presentation through the presidential lecture series last year. Uh, Dr. Clara Chang did a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, presentation on implicit biases. And I would encourage uh, you to tap into that and, and we may ask her back to do a, another series uh, this year uh, on implicit biases. Number five, understanding how anti-racism needs to be intersectional. So we must understand how things connect with other things. So how does it connect with gender, sexuality, and ethnicity? It's imperative to use an intersectional approach when we're talking about anti-racism. And number six, be a champion. Champion anti-racist ideas and policies. You can't be anti-racist without action. So I'm gonna repeat that. You cannot be anti-racist without action. Ways you can take action are by supporting organizations in your community um, that are fighting policies to create racial disparities. Use your power and privilege to make changes. It could be at the grade school level. It could be at the government or corporate levels. You just have to take action. Um, someone asked me before, how can you do this? Again, I'd say uh, through three things, your time, your talent, and your treasure. Your time, your talent, and your treasure. 
also be sure when you're, um, well, actually, before I get to that, I want to also share uh, a list of different resources that you can use uh, when looking at racial justice. These are some great books. Obviously, I talked about the How to Be an Anti-Racist book by Ibram X. Kendi, uh, which we'll be doing at the staff and faculty level. And some others here, and I'll share this in the chat as well. And our common read, I just want to shout out this year is Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. It was our common reader last year, uh, but the university has taken it a hold uh, this year as well. So I'd encourage you to uh, follow that. Uh -oh. We also have some other racial justice resources. Um, and this one, uh, a lot on this list, and I'll share this in the chat as well, um, are geared towards uh, kids as well. So if you're a parent and say, oh, how do I have these discussions with my kid? Um, you know, how can I talk to them about issues that are so taboo in, in certain cases and you, you just don't know how to handle it? Um, maybe I'm not an expert. Maybe my parents didn't talk to me about it. How can I do that? Um, Here's some resources there. Um, also to be make sure in your collection when you're talking to kids in particular um, that include black children or other children of color, uh, make sure that you're sharing stories that experience joy, adventure, and love. Um, otherwise, you may inadvertently portray the black experience as one that is just suffering or um, and, and not one that shows resilience. And we want to make sure that you know, you're holistic when you're showing that from not, not a deficit model, but more so from an asset-based model. And finally, uh, for this in, in the interest of time, because we want to get to some of your questions, uh, this is a, a quote from the late uh, John Congressman John Lewis, who is actually a dear friend of mine. Uh, so I think it, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, shout him out in this presentation. Never, ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. Um, and that's something that I would leave you with today uh, as we go forward in, in life together. Thank you so much, Malia and Ryan. Um, I love that last quote, Ryan. Perfect, perfect way to end this conversation. Um, so let me check the chat. And I know we did have some questions in there. Um, one of the questions I think that was asked and perhaps answered, but it's worth repeating, um, question from one of our trustees. Of the 171 people in Pennsylvania killed by police, how many or what percentage were persons of color? And Jess Gold wrote back, there is a website, mappingpoliceviolence.org, is a research collaborative collecting comprehensive data on police, killing nation, police killings nationwide. So that's a source, mappingpoliceviolence.org. And that information that was on the slide I, underneath it had the resource. That is exactly where it was taken from. So if you go into that you can actually tap on it and it can break it all down for you according to race, gender. And now what it will do, it will show it to you visually, but I could not get it to nail it down for me and give me a percentage. But if you play around with it more, you probably can really get it down to the percentage, but you'll be able to see everything you want on that mapping.org. Great, terrific. Um, we have a question about will alumni be able to join the anti-racism book club? I know that's intended to be for students. Are alumni welcome as well? Well, we do have one that's going to be, it's going to be started up uh, geared towards faculty and, uh, and staff. Um, and we wanted to kind of intentionally start there as, as we're serving um, our major stakeholder, which is our students. Um, but that is something that, you know, the, the, the uh, I guess the sky's the limit. I mean, if it's something of interest for alumni to, to do, get in contact with me. And if we can get a group together to supplement that, let's do it. Terrific. Well, we can include it in an upcoming newsletter to alumni and see what kind of interest there, there might be. That's Excellent. great. Um, we have a question about, do you think the elections, how are the elections going to affect the racial situation? Any thoughts on that? That's a $60,000 oh, you know, well, yeah, question. Yeah, I, yeah, I say that, yeah, that's a, a really good one. But um, I'd Big say, one. yeah, definitely it's going to have uh, some impact, good and positively and negatively. I mean, we're seeing it now. Um, one of the things that we talked about offline uh, before this call, and I think it was the, just the four of us, uh, Kim, Malia, myself, and Amy, um, just, you know, out of all of the trials and controversy, um, there's been a lot of great things that have come out of it. Um, one, there's been a lot of different policy changes that have taken place as a result. We have a lot of young people, a lot of people who are taking activism you know, by the hands and, and really going out and advocating for change. Mm -hmm. um, so I, and at the same time, you do see some, some people who are doing some negative things too. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's a both and. I think some things um, have to get worse before they get better. 
Um, but, you know, unfortunately, I think that, um, you know, it's just with anything, any, any change that, uh, that occurs, you're going to have um, both positive and negative outcomes. Malia, do you have any comments on that or should I move on? You know what? I was thinking to myself that it, this is such an intense time in history right now. And with all that we are dealing with facing the racial injustices and inequity, I definitely think this election, as you said, that's the $60,000 question right there, if not way more than that. Um, I definitely think that this, this election is going to be critical and key. And if nothing else, you know, get out and vote. If it is, you cannot get out and vote in person, please mail in your vote as soon as you can so that it can be counted. There's a lot of different things going on that could prevent um, your voting. And I, I, I will just leave it at that. But do yourself a favor, do us all a favor, get out and vote, be a part of it. Your voice needs to be heard. If you want it to have impact, start with you. I believe everything begins with us. Terrific, agree. Um, so the civil rights tour, and I know that um, Linda Shafino uh, was a key person starting that, and I think she's on the call uh, today. Can you talk about that, Ryan, and the importance of that um, activity for our students? Well, certainly appreciate that. Um, and that was actually one of the things on my list. And so thank you for bringing that up, Linda. <laughs> Thank you. Please forgive me. Uh, one of the uh, important things that we have is our, our civil Roots of the Civil Rights Tour, um, which we're really excited about. It actually happens every two years. This year was actually canceled due to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, however, it's an opportunity for students to get a nine-day tour of the Deep South and hear from different stakeholders who were a part of the civil rights movement, visit historical sites, um, and really just encapsulate themselves in a a, an experience that will give them, um, you know, realities of what it was like during the times of the civil rights. Um, and we're hoping that it's a transformative experience that when students go, um, they come back changed and they come back different, uh, thinking differently um, mm -hmm. on how they view the world. And it's, a, it's an excellent opportunity that we're encouraging students uh, to participate in. It is actually low cost. So during, uh, you know, with the help of alumni who has done a fabulous job um, with uh, their fi financial contributions, to make it possible, um, it, you know, without you, you don't get, have these experiences. Um, so we, you know, like to thank you and we, we urge you to continue to help support uh, civil rights tours for our, our students so that they have this experience. And are there plans then to have um, that tour this coming summer? Is yes, the plan, plan is to, in June. Uh, so they, they go on a nine day tour and it's actually for credit purposes also. So, I mean, like I said, it's actually a course uh, that the students will enroll in. Um, and we have limited spots uh, due to funding. We take about 12 uh, students is a good number um, each year or every two years uh, on the civil rights tour. So uh, Joe Waller, I don't know if he's on the call as well. He's um, gonna be going down with the students uh, in June. Great. We have a question about further explaining how to participate in the mural project if you're not an artist. Can you tell, talk a little bit about the activities? For well, those yeah. of us who draw stick yeah, so, figures. Well, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a stick figure kind of guy myself. So, um, you, know, <laughs> I, you know, I'm one of the types. So you just show me the, the piece where I'm supposed to paint and I can kind of follow it. Um, it's kind of like a, in a painting with a twist kind of uh, kind of kind of uh, mentality. So you kind of just, if you can draw on the lines, you can try that. But really the, uh, the goal is just really to bring community together um, in an effort to do a project that's meaningful and important. Um, so if not, it could be helping to record stories or hear from uh, community members about their experience in their communities. Um, these are communities that are oftentimes overlooked or looked at um, from, again, a deficit model. But I think, you know, put, you know visiting and, and engaging with community members connects Carlo also with the community mm. and the community with Carlo. So I think that's a, an awesome way for you to get connected. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely, Ryan. Connecting the community with Carlo is very, very important, and Carlo with the community. And um, we would, I, be, would we be and, also, Ryan, you really using our student leaders and our student organizations and clubs to promote this and to really garner more student participation as well as we kick off the school year? Yes, yeah, and, it's, and the project itself will run from September to October. Um, so it's going to be ongoing, so there may be a space for you, even if it's 10, 15 minutes to give of your time to visit 
and uh, and, and work on it. It is something that's uh, that will be an awesome experience. Well, thank you. Thank you, Malia and Ryan, so much for being with us today. And we're grateful for all the information you shared and for your continuing to lead this effort uh, on behalf of Carlo, our faculty, staff, and students. We, we appreciate your time today. I want to thank encourage you. all of you to join us again in September, September 16th to hear from Dr. Matthew Gordley, Dean of Carlo's newest college, the College of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Gordley will share goals and opportunities for this new college and introduce other leaders in the college. Thank you all again for joining us today and have a great Wednesday. I'll see you soon as well. Thank you.